Um, we'll solve them. Okay, we can start. So I hope that our students are not go, will not have any technical problems anymore and tech problems with the technology. And those who are interested can join us. I just would like to make sure that Nick is with us. Yes, he's here. Hello. Uh, I would like to greet all our participants. I would like to thank the Dean of Yerevan State University Journalism Faculty for organizing the series of lectures on implementing with Poika. And I would like to uh, add that this the project is being um, implemented with the support of the Danish organization. And this is the fourth lecture that we're organizing for the students of our faculty. And tomorrow we're going to have our last lecture. And this is already for in-service journalists who work in different media outlets. And uh, that is that will be the crown and we will conclude our program. I'm hopeful that our students received a comprehensive and very valuable information in order to organize their future professional activity um, more effectively. Our uh, colleague, uh, Nick Much, is going to be our presenter today, and I had the honor of uh, interacting with him when he came to Armenia last autumn, and he was one of those unbiased and courageous journalists who arrived here and went straight to the front line in order to do his journalistic duty before the public and to inform the general public uh, from the objective and an unbiased position, all the processes and all the developments that were taking place on the front line. So I think that his speech is also going to be interesting from the perspective that he is the direct eyewitness of whatever happened to us and of whatever followed the military actions since November to this day. So before giving the floor to Nick, I would like to give the floor to the Dean of our faculty for his welcome uh, remarks, and then we'll give the floor to Nick in order to listen to his valuable experience and his, exp his valuable recommendations. Thank you, Ms. Doyan. I would like to greet you all. I would like to greet our honorable guests uh, and all our students who have joined us at the moment. I would like to especially thank FOICA, Freedom of Information Center in Armenia, and its president, Ms. Doidoyan, for this very important undertaking and this important collaboration. And I think that uh, her uh, initiatives will be continuous in various formats and one day we will also have an offline meeting even though the projections and the predictions for all countries and uh, in all continents uh, testify to the opposite still we would like to remain hopeful and optimistic looking towards the opportunities of offline meetings uh, today i would like to uh, greet our guest mr munch who is uh, 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 Thank you, 
որպեսի ընթացքում այլևս չընդհատենք այդ հարցերի անդադարման նպատակով։ Շատ լավ, շնորհակալություն Տիկին Դոյդեան եւ Պարո Մարտիոսյան Զեյ Բացմանովսկի համար։ Տեղեկացնեմ, որ քանի որ Թոմ մաչը, տես Թոմ մաչ ունի երկու ամ, Նիկ եւ Թոմ, սա զուտ նաեւ ձեզ համար հարգելի մասնակիցներ, ինքս ստորագրում է իր աշխատանքները, որպես Թոմ մաչ, այնպես որ եթե դուք հանդիպեք նաեւ Նիկ մաչ անունով, նույն նոր զելանդացի լրագրող հեղինակն է այդ մեկ երկրորդը քանի որ խոսելու է հեղինակը անգլերեն խնդրում ենք ձեզ ինտերպրետեշն կոճակը որը նման է գլոբուսի սեղմել եւ այնտեղից ընտրել ֆրանսերեն բաժինը որպիսի կարողանաք լսել հայերեն եթե խոսնակը խոսի հայերեն օրինակ ինչպես Տիկին Դոյդեան ներ կամ Պավ Մարտիոսյանը խոսում են հայերեն այդ ժամանակ դուք կրկին այդ ալիքում կլսեք հայերենը։ Եթե ցանկանում եք անգլերենը լսել, ապա նույն ինտերպրետեշն բաժնից որպես օրիգինալ ընտրեք անգլերեն տարբերակը։ Սա տեխնիկական առումով նշեմ նաև որ մոտավորապես այսպիսին է բաժանումը, շուրջ 40 րոպե մենք կլսենք Նիկ մաչին, որոշակի դաթարի ընթացքում դուք որպես մասնակիցներ հնարավորություն կունենաք հարցեր ուղելու, հարցերը կարող եք տալ հայերեն եւ թարգմանություն կլինի անգլերեն կարող եք տալ նաեւ անգլերեն ինչպես ձեզ հարմար է հարցերը կարող եք գրել նաեւ չատում այս մասին եւս նշեմ որից հետո հինիկը կանա դառնա երկրորդ թեմային հարցերին պատասխանելուց հետո եւ կրկին դուք նարավորություն կունենաք հարցեր հղելու այդ պատճառով այս պահին խնդրում եմ նիկին մի անալ մեզ միկրոֆոնը միասնել եւ արդեն անգլերեն ալիքում խոսել եւ հասանելի կլինի թարգմանությունը մյուսներին շնորհակալություն Nick the floor is yours please join and mute yourself and let's start your presentation Hi there just very quickly just checking that uh, I'm heard and the connection is stable it's all good Yeah everything is good yeah I'll get into it Okay so once again thank you very much for inviting me I'm I'm very glad to be here and I'm I'm honored that you consider my experience is is worth sharing with students who want to do this sometimes very dangerous but very valuable sort of work now before I talk uh, go into my lecture I'm going to start with ex uh, explaining three particular hostile environment situations that I've been in because I think they cover a broad spectrum of all of the potential risks that journalists may face when they're conducting their work So I will start of course with the one that we are all familiar with which is the recent conversation in Artsakh. I was there for several weeks in October covering the conflict for a variety of mainly British and American media outlets. Uh if you uh tuned into my lecture my recent lecture at the Media Initiative Center some of this will overlap but I I think the story is very instructive. So we had been spend we had spent about Three hours in Martuni. Now, this was towards the end of October, and the city had been very, very heavily shelled. It was covered in de the debris, glass, broken windows everywhere. In the distance, well, sometimes not even the distance. Sometimes very close to us, we could hear explosions all around us, mainly from Azerbaijani artillery fire. And we asked our, our minder, who was uh, an Armenian, uh, you know, should we be worried? And he's like, don't worry at all about the artillery fire. The main thing you need to be worried about here is the drones. If you hear them, then you start to get scared. And of course, very very soon we did hear uh, drones overhead, and we made the decision to go as quickly as possible back to our media vans and just get out as quickly as we possibly can. Now we had been driving for maybe about 2 minutes we just left Martini when to our left all of a sudden we saw an absolutely massive explosion which rocked the van and sent everyone in the in the van into you know we got really scared because we We had no idea that this was coming. Uh we found out later that that was most likely to have been a, a drone strike from one of the Turkish Bayraktar Mark II models. And Nick, then to I'm our left interrupting you Nick. I just uh, noticed that there is no translation service at the moment in none of the channels. Uh, oh there is. In what uh, in what channel because I tried to It is in French channel because I can hear uh uh Christine in French channel. 
հարգելի մասնակիցներ, եթե դուք ուզում եք հայերեն թարգմանությամբ լսել, ապա եղեք French Channel-ի վրա, նա, French Channel-ում հայերեն թարգմանվում է, եթե ուզում եք անգլերեն, ումա չեք լսում, ես լսում, չի լինում, հարություն ճան, չի լինում, French, հետ բանով չի լսում, չեք լսում հիմա ինք, հայինք և չենք լսում, չէ, ինչ նա հետաքրքիր, ես լսում եմ, French Channel-ում, ես լսում եմ, չի լսում ես տեղ, հիմա չեք լսում, հա հիմա լսվում է, հիմա լսվում է, հիմա լսվում է, իրականում ես միշտ եմ լսել հայերեն չանլը, չգիտեմ ինչ որ, ես է ես ընտացքում հարություն ունել գրեցի, որ չեմ լսում, եկ եկ դա կազմակերպ ենք էլ իմի հար, մի հատ, So once again, I am on English channel. I am on English channel. You can hear now the in French channel the Armenian translation, right? Yeah, it starts. Okay. Okay. So Nick, so sorry for this technical issue. Please continue. Yeah. Um, because there was no translation, would you like me to start again? I was only yes, 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 yes. It would be nice. Yeah. All right, I'll start again. I'll start again from the beginning. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, these things happen all the time with Zoom lectures. I think everyone is very used to them by now. And uh, yes, I do hope to do an, an offline event at uh, some point soon. Anyway, so go back to the start. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm honored that my experience is, is considered worthwhile to teach to your students about this very rewarding, but also very often very dangerous and, and demanding field of work. And I want to start uh, before I go into the main body of the lecture, by talking a little bit about three of the different, possibly most dangerous situations I've encountered in reporting, not just on conflict, but also on civil unrest and even in politics. So the first is, as uh, I'm the conflict where everyone here is familiar with, which is is the war was the war in Artsakh. I spent several weeks in Artsakh in October covering the conflict, and I have since come back uh, several times to uh, report on the follow-up, and I hope to do to be back again in Armenia later this month to continue my work. Now, this situation is an example of what, you know, a serious and very, very, you know, difficult conflict zone looks like. I'm sure many of you were there, or are at least for everyone must know people who were there, and I'm sure you're all familiar with just how brutal it could be. So this situation happened to me when we were in Martoni. This was late in October when the war was getting extremely dangerous and extremely difficult, particularly on the Armenian side of the front line. We had been walking around in Martoni for several hours, getting video recordings and doing various sort of investigations. Now, we had been, you know, for anyone who uh, went there will recognize the scene, broken glass everywhere, destroyed buildings, absolutely no civilians in the streets, you could just hear, occasionally hear stray dogs or cats and, but you could constantly hear the shelling and the bombing that was going on in the background not too far away from us. And my convoy of journalists, there were maybe about six of us there at that point in time, asked the person from the Armenian army who was taking us around and being our minder, should we be worried about this? Is it time to leave? And he said, no, by the time you've heard the explosion, it's fine, it's missed you. What you, nearly, what you really need to be scared of is the sound of drones and you will hear them. Now, sure enough, about five or 10 minutes later after he said that, we heard the first sound of the drones above us. And we immediately stopped and decided it was time to leave and time to hightail it and, and leave back to uh, Stepanakert. So we ran back to our minivan and we left the, the town and just about probably two minutes after leaving Martini, we saw a massive explosion to our left and it rocked the van and every journalist in the van suddenly got, you know, we got very scared and very shocked because none of us had expected that the fire was coming this close to us. And we found out later that that was most likely a strike from one of the Turkish supplied uh, Bayraktar Mark II models. And, you know, one of the, one of the models that did the most damage to uh, both soldiers and civilians during the conflict. And not only that, but only about a minute later, 
we were then hit by a number of Israeli supplied Harop suicide drones that hit just to our right. And now our driver basically started screaming and swearing, just put his foot on the accelerator, and we must have driven off back towards Stepanakert, veering all around potholes in the road at around 150 kilometers an hour. And we eventually get back, got back to Stepanakert and we were all fairly shocked at what had happened. And the more journalists we spoke to, the more we found out that almost everybody who had covered Artsakh had had an experience like this. So after that, you know, it, this has become part of my filing to the European Court about the potential targeting of journalists in the conflict zone. There were many other journalists, including the ones from Le Monde, who were very well publicized, as well as a number of local Armenian reporters who were hit and set many of them very, very badly injured. So my experience there, while very frightening for us at the time, is not by any means the worst one that was faced by journalists covering Artsakh. Now I want to move on to a completely different story from a different conflict zone that people will probably be much less familiar with because it illustrates some of the other kind of dangers that you can face when you're reporting from countries in, in crisis. This happened to be in Venezuela. Now, Venezuela, I, I, for those of you who don't know what's going on in Venezuela, it is not the same kind of conflict as in Nagorno-Karabakh or in Syria or Iraq, where there are specific sides that are fighting and a lot of gunfire and a lot of artillery or anything. This is the example of a political, social and economic crisis that has gotten very, very, very out of hand. And it has made Venezuela, while there are no front lines and no sides fighting directly, there is an extraordinary risk kidnapping, of petty crime, of, uh, of petty crime and a, an extraordinary risk of, of being killed just by normal crime or organized crime. So I was doing a story on the migration or, or the, the fleeing of refugees from Venezuela to Colombia. And to do that, I was going to a city called Merida in the east of Venezuela, where I was expecting to meet one of my fixers so that we could do a story there. Now, what ended up happening there is I got to the border, I had planned to cross as a tourist and I had my itinerary prepared. And I had thought that I could, I, I arrived at the border at midday and thought that I would be, you know, there by the afternoon ready to take, and I had planned to take public transport to meet my fixer on the border because I thought that that would have less, uh, there would be less of a chance that I'd be noticed by the authorities that way. Now that border crossing ended up taking about seven and a half hours and I couldn't get to there until maybe about seven or 30 or eight o'clock at night and it was pitch black. Now if anyone was in Stepanakert during the war they will know what, they, what properly pitch black looks like. It means no street lights, no car lights, the only lights that were there were the lights of fires that people had um, lit in the street. And I was trying to ask for directions to where the local bus station was. And eventually I get pointed down some extremely dark uh, street and some extremely dark alley. And so I, I walk there a little bit, but I'm getting starting to get very worried that this could end quite badly. And I eventually find what is what looked at least like the remnants of a bus station. It just said Estación de Autobús, the Spanish for bus station. And it looked like it was out of some kind of disaster movie. The street sign, the letters in the sign of the bus station were swinging off. The buses I could see inside had their windows smashed out. And I remember looking in that, in that station and thinking, if I go in there, there's a reasonable chance that I'm not going to ever come out again. So I followed my instincts and I immediately just turned around and left. And about 30 seconds after I'd left and started walking the other way, I hear the sound of a number of gunshots coming from exactly that bus station that I had been planning to walk into very, very recently. And I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I just ran as fast as I could towards the center of the town, found the nearest hotel. And I said, I'm needing to stay here for the night and rearranged my, my, thing, my assignment a little bit. Now, it all worked out fine in the end. I was able to be told that actually this was happening. The old bus station found the new bus station in the morning. But 
the reason I tell this story is to give you an idea of one, some examples of things that you probably shouldn't be doing and ways to better prepare yourself. And also to give you an example that people here may not be familiar with in as much. So covering the war in Karabakh had a very specific set of risks and dangers. And those dangers were almost entirely down to fire, incoming fire from the enemy side, drones, bullets, ballistics, or anything like that. But there were some advantages that many journalists found in working in the conflict zone in Artsakh. They included the fact that we had a, that most of us were working alongside the Armenian or the Nagorno-Karabakh armed forces, who were generally a very reliable and helpful and very easy to work with armed forces. There are many countries in which you have to be care very, very careful of any sort of authorities that you're in because they may be thinking that you're some kind of a spy or a saboteur or something like that. And to do that, I want to illustrate that with the example again of Venezuela. One of my colleagues in Venezuela, a man named um, Joshua Collins, was actually kidnapped by the Venezuelan border guard on the border with Colombia. He was taken into a cell and he was tr they tried to extort him for $10,000, saying that if you don't you know, cough up this money by the next morning, you're going to be sent to Caracas and you're going to go to prison as a spy or a terrorist for 10 years. Now in Venezuela, as I said, there were no risks of the kind we, you faced in Nagorno-Karabakh, but there were risks that could have been every bit as serious and severe. And you need to be ready for a whole spectrum of these risks. Now, the third example I want to use just briefly, just because it gives you an idea of what you can run into, is I was once in a city and I was at the headquarters of a local media organization. And all of a sudden, just completely out of nowhere, I heard gunshots coming from a bridge in front of me. I turned around to look and I saw a crowd of what must be about 50 to 100 people just running towards me screaming. And no one knew what was going on. No one had any idea. I picked up my camera and I went towards the bridge to get as much footage as I can. And eventually that area was cordoned off by police and we found out what happened. Now, that city was London. And this was the aftermath and the, the media organization I was outside was the headquarters of the Sunday Times, you know, one of the most, you know, well known media outlets in the world. And this had it was in a terrorist attack that took place on London Bridge several years ago. This is just giving you a little bit of an, and yet I found myself in a, you know, not, this wasn't in Nairobi, this wasn't in Mogadishu or in Damascus. This was in a very, what is generally considered, you know, a very safe, uh, protected city. And so this is again, just giving you examples of the quite wide range of situations that you can find yourself working in as a journalist from intense warfare and conflict to extremely, to very, uh, difficult civil and political situations and to just working in your everyday life in your everyday office at that time I was covering British politics you know the politics of Brexit and I would never have expected to find myself in the middle of a terrorist attack there but that just shows you what you can what you can have so I want to go over a little bit also of the way that conflict reporting has changed over about probably the last 20 years or so. And unfortunately, the, it is mostly bad news because the safety of conflict reporters has generally gone down since conflicts in the 1990s. So in the 1980s and 1990s, in the 1980s and 1990s, some of the major wars that people were covering were those in Africa, those in Latin America, and especially the wars in Yugoslavia, when the Yugoslavian uh, Federation broke down and there were wars in Croatia, in Bosnia, in Central America, you had the Contras versus the, and the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, and um, the, to this day, you still have an ongo a smaller ongoing insurgency in Colombia. However, 
back in those days, the vast majority of these places did not have media coverage of their own in the, in the sense that while they still had local journalists, their ability to communicate and get their message to the outside world was rather limited. So very often you would have armed rebel groups or even groups that were involved in illegal activities like arms trading or narcotics smuggling and they would give you access to their side of the story they would invite you in they'd interview you obviously I'm talking about colleagues experiences this was before long before I started reporting but the only major way they had to get their message to the outside world was by saying by talking to local and international media and leaving them more or less unharmed. There were, there were of course, exceptions, and those exceptions started to, cross, to crop up in the war in Bosnia. But for the main time, for the most part, journalists were seen as people who could be useful to get uh, an armed group's message out to the wider public. So they were mostly left alone. However, now what happens is we get to the wars mostly in the Middle Eastern and North African regions, beginning with the invasion of Afghanistan and the invasion of Iraq and going on to the war in, wars in Syria and in Libya. Now, in many cases, in a large part because of the, the coalition invasions in Iraq and Afghanistan, regardless of what you think about whether those wars were right or just, the perception came that reporters, especially from the Western world, and, and I have to say um, an Armenian reporter in these situations would likely be considered a citizen of the Western world, they found out that what the two changes were one that western journalists were now seen to be to an extent allied with what was seen as occupying or invading forces so you have the situation where you stop being seen as neutral observers to a conflict and you started to be seen as people who were helping one side this, along with the rise of the Islamic radical movements that happened in these countries, mean that journalists could, were now seen to be targeted, despite all of the laws of war. The second thing was the advantage, was the rise of social media and the internet and different means that groups could communicate with the outside world. So the best known examples are probably of those in in ISIS in Syria and the journalists reporting from there. Now, as we know, between all know, between 2012 and 2014, there were a spate of journalist killings and executions in ISIS and also in rebel held ter territories in Syria. And this made it extremely dangerous for any Western reporter to go and cover the situation. Those who could, could go took extremely high risks. They had to pay for an extraordinarily expensive security requirement and along with the, the decline in newsroom budgets that's been going on as well, it was a much, much more difficult and dangerous place to report from those wars. The rise of social media also meant that a lot of these groups, because they could use their own Facebook accounts or Twitter accounts or what have you, could spread their message directly to the audience they wanted. That is why in Syria you had so many of the rebel groups, especially ISIS, giving their information you know, giving they, they had their own information networks, effectively their own TV channels that they could use to target potential supporters. So journalists and from the West were no longer considered useful in the way they had been in the 1990s or the 1980s, or even going back as far as the Vietnam War or, or wars before that. So that a bit is an overview of the media landscape that we are now working in.
I should make clear also that before I go into the various risks, uh, one thing is that I come from the perspective of almost always in these cases, with a few exceptions, I have been a foreign correspondent. Now, I'm originally from New Zealand and I have done some work on criminal gangs and some dangerous work there, but for the main part, my conflict experience is all in foreign conflict zones. If you are a local journalist, as for instance, if many of you may be, if you want to go and report on Karabakh in more detail, or if ever there is fighting that breaks out again, there will be slight differences in how you approach matters than you would if you're going to a foreign conflict zone, whether it happens to be Syria or at the moment uh, Ethiopia, which is actually where the probably the, one of the probably the world's deadliest war is going on right now. And there are also a number of issues that while I uh, while I can briefly cover, they are issues that either I have not experienced. So for instance, while I've had a close call, I've never been kidnapped or in a ransom situation. And there are also dangers that face female journalists as well, more so than male journalists. They can include risks of harassment or risks of sexual violence that are faced less so by male reporters. So while these are very important topics, I cannot give a, an informed or expert opinion about those topics in the way that I may be able to with other issues or uh, with more general issues. So I wanted to take a few examples of just the kinds of dangers that you can face in a variety of these conflict zones. So if we're in a conflict zone like Karabakh, say, or Iraq and Afghanistan, you can face the battlefield hazards, whether it's small arms fire, aerial bombardments, booby traps and landmines. Karabakh is one of the most mined areas in the world, um, but my, mines are also something that can linger for decades onwards. You can find them in, for instance, uh, many mines, are, people are still killed uh, by mines, including reporters in Vietnam and Cambodia after the wars have been over for almost 40, 50 years. If you're reporting on, you can also face terrorist attacks where they could be suicide bombers, gunmen and knife attacks, and also sometimes you can be taken hostage because people want to make a political point or extort a government. There's also the criminal risk that you can face anywhere, particularly in low income countries of, uh, of just mugging and, and violent assault. Then there is also, this is something we consider more as a foreign correspondent, you need to consider the risk to your fixers and your translators and the people that you are working with. Now, while foreign correspondent is considered, you know, it's considered quite a laudable, quite a cool job to do and a, and a kind of a dangerous and risky job, the the risks that we take are actually far lower than the risks of the people we work with on the ground. So whenever you think to, uh, whenever you think that you're, you need to follow particular things or in particular danger, you must realize that there are also a number of other people who are in more danger because as the most part, as a foreign correspondent, you can leave and they cannot, and they can be faced with much more pushback from authorities or local armed groups. So, for instance, over the past decade, over 500, the number is around 650 journalists have been verified to have been killed as a result of, either as a result of their work or because they have been in, in a conflict zone. Now, in, in 2015, tw 25, it's a bit harder to, to talk about 2020 simply because the COVID-19 pandemic stopped a lot of foreign correspondence and also actually with the exception of Artsakh made a lot of conflict zones quite quieter. Around 25 journalists were killed in, in 13 countries and the, actually the most dangerous country for journalists now is Mexico where about half of all the journalists who are murdered live and they are often killed by armed gangs such as the cartels. Now in addition to that journalists must be concerned also with dangers to their mental and psychological well-being. So for instance, 
Many journalists have a, the, the lifetime prevalence of PTSD, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists, is around 30% of, of, for journalists who frequently cover armed conflict. About 20 to 25% will experience major depressive disorder, and between 15 and 20% have substance abuse issues involving drugs or alcohol. However, again, Going back to the point about local journalists, nine in 10 work-related fatalities, according to journalists, were local journalists working in their country of origin. And one of the sad lessons, for instance, that came out in the Artsakh conflict was that while the two Le Monde journalists who were gravely injured in what we believe was a grad strike, also in Martini that everyone heard about, there was also a local uh, media reporter who was killed there at the same time in the same attack. And that killing has received much, much less coverage. So I do want to stress that that is very, very important. So now to get into what the rules are that I would consider of covering conflict zones in my experience and in the experience of my colleagues that I have consulted. So I want to start with the major one that as a journalist, your life, your physical or your mental well-being is always more important than the story you're telling. There is the saying that dead men tell no tales, and this saying applies to journalists as well. You also need to consider, and this is something that is a lot of especially younger freelance foreign correspondents come in, is that they, you are not just taking risks for yourself. You're taking risks for your family and your friends, your colleagues, and even your country, because your country may be involved. If you get kidnapped, for instance, you, you may force your country to be involved in hostage nego negotiations. So you need to actually, rather than being gung-ho, can seriously consider all of the risks you are taking. And you need to be realistic about your physical and emotional limitations. There are, and there is no shame in not being ready to do particular jobs in, co uh, whether it's in a conflict or in covering crime or anything like that. And uh, it is also important to note that you may not know your physical or mental or emotional limits before you step place into one of the one of these zones. Some people can react to it absolutely fine. Others can react extraordinarily badly. So it is always good to be, have some awareness of your limits. And this also applies to editors as well, and especially young freelancers will have this thing, this project. But uh, this thought process where they think we have to take a job, otherwise our editors, you know, might not want us to report anymore, or they may take another person. And an editor should never penalize a journalist for taking an assignment based on the considerable risk. I'm going to give an example actually from my own career very, very recently is that I was, when I was in Artsakh, one editor who I had been planning to file stories for actually said that because there were less journalists on the Azerbaijani side, that he wanted me to leave Karabakh and go straight into Azerbaijan, effectively fly to Istanbul and then fly to Baku and try and get in as a tourist or something to try and report on the conflict uh, from that side. Now, there were much fewer journalists in Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan is a much more difficult country to work in media-wise. Now, especially for someone who had been, as I was, spending significant amount of time with Armenian forces in Karabakh. That could have been an extremely dangerous job where I face not only the risk of you know, artillery fire or... or, or uh, gunfire, but I could have easily faced the risk of arrest or killing by the side that I was working for because the Azerbaijani side were not a side that were friendly to journalists in general. I'm not going to name um, who this uh, editor or organization was, but these are red flags that you need to watch out for when you're working. Never be afraid to turn down a job in case you feel that you need to, uh, in that you genuinely feel you're not comfortable with after assessing the risks. That said, the other thing you have to remember is that this is inherently a dangerous job. You need to be willing and ready to take 
certain risks that are just avoidable. Were there, are there any of the risks I have talked about? And there's one risk I want to talk about that is particularly, um, I think particularly prevalent and, and worth raising at the moment. And that is the risk of, of uh, contracting COVID-19. Other people may have different opinions on this, but it has been my opinion and that, that of, of many of my colleagues, that if you are going to travel and you're going to try and report in difficult environments now, then you do take the risk of, of contracting COVID-19, among other things, and that is something that you have to be willing and ready to prepare and deal with. And while you can take mitigatory measures, there are not many that can protect you. And all, all journalists in Karabakh that I know, well, most of them came down with COVID. And that was just something that we had to accept as being part of the job. Now, I want to cover also, once you're prepared for those ground rules, some of the things that you should do before you are going into any sort of hazardous environment zones. And one of the first things that you need to do is make sure that you are very, very well prepared with your knowledge about the situation that you are going into. What you, what you almost always want to do is you need to sit down, hopefully with an editor who is willing to you know, be generous with their time and their expertise and prepare security assessments for the zones you are going to. So what that includes is that you need to have particular contact people who know where you are, who expect you to be checking in at a reasonable um, purpose and time, who hopefully are knowledgeable about conflict zones and safety and have all and uh, know of the hazards that you are going into. Uh, with luck, um, they should hopefully, and if, if we obviously we would like to avoid this and this is not a situation everybody can find themselves in, hopefully they have access to some sort of supply of, of cash if you need it or if you're being extorted to get you out of a situation that you are in. And hopefully you should have a contingency plan worked out for, with your editor with your editorial staff in terms of what you need to take you should also make sure to contact people who are very familiar with the local environment i like to make sure that before i go to a hazardous reporting zone i have spoken to at least one foreign reporter who has been there within the last two to three months and who can advise me on the situation and at least one local journalist who is from the region and who can keep me up to date on the latest happenings hopefully that would be someone on the ground but it could also be someone who is recently prepared for it you also need to make sure that you are in good physical and psychological health. In many of these conflict zones, this was generally not the case in Karabakh. We had fairly, we were fairly well supplied and had access to medical equipment and to a solid supply of, of food and water. But if you're in somewhere, for instance, one of my colleagues does a lot of research in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where you could frequently find yourself without access to clean drinking water or sanitary facilities or you could find it or without you know food stores or preparation and here is, and so you should always be make sure you visit your doctor and you go through everything that could potentially be wrong with you you also want to make sure that you are carrying some sort of first aid kit with you at all times or as often as it can be. And you need, if you take prescription medication, you need to make sure you have an extra long supply of it. The other thing you need to be very, very uh, careful about is cash. I always try and carry maybe 400 to 500 US dollars in my shoes. Just because if I happen to have something stolen or I lose a wallet or something, or I get mugged or something like that, I have access to an emergency supply of money that can get me out of the situation I'm in and it can get me to some sort of a safe house. Also, I need to be honest with this is get your teeth fixed and checked up. A dental appointment is extremely valuable. And I had an experience once like this in my own career where I was in Mexico. 
I was due to do a story and I came down with a tooth abscess, which kept me out of work for the last, for about two weeks. And that was simply because I just hadn't had a, a dental checkup in a long enough time. Look, probably don't want to know all of this sort of information. It's the kind of information you need to be aware of about your own health. Now, I wasn't working in a conflict zone or a dangerous area at that point, but the team I was working with, a, a, a British uh, documentary team, was going to do a story in Mexico that involved interviewing Diego Maradona. Now, it's, it's, that would have been an absolutely fantastic opportunity for me as a football fan and as a journalist to get to interview someone like that. And because I had simply taken the medical precautions I needed, I had to turn it down. Now, that is a slightly lighthearted and funnier example, but it could, if I had had that when I was in the middle of Venezuela or in Eastern Ukraine or some other conflict zone, that could have extraordinary, that would have meant that I could have been in genuinely serious danger because the pain was so much that I wouldn't have been able to concentrate or keep aware of my surroundings. Now, there are other things that you should take with you. Reporters Without Borders has come up with a very, very in, uh, useful, and I can provide the link to anyone who's interested, list of essentials that you could should take with you in some conflict zone. Now, you want to prepare, be uh, re expecting and hoping the best, but prepare for the worst. So prepare that almost any piece of equipment that can fail will fail. So you want to bring things like, you want to bring multiple flashlights. You want to bring probably at least two phones. This can be useful in case one of them is a dummy phone that you can hand over in the case where you could be robbed or, or extorted or something. You want to make sure you have at least two toiletry bags with anything you could possibly need. A plug adapter. I've been in cases where I simply haven't been able to file it. I had filed the story late simply because I didn't have the right plug, which is a very silly oversight, but it's the kind of thing that can happen. You want multiple copies of your passport. And if anyone has, any, has the ability to get two passports, that's extremely valuable and extremely useful, whether they're two passports from the same country or two passports for diff from different countries, because many countries very much do not like it if you happen to visit a country, whether it's Armenia and Azerbaijan or India and Pakistan or Israel and Iran, many countries will very, very much not like it if you have done reporting in a country that they are enemies with. And you should also have, if you can, although it's not always practical, have sleeping bags and sleeping equipment because you may be cut off and not able to get back to your, your safe house. Now, when you're preparing closer to the time, when you're on the ground, one of the most important things to consider is your teammates. Are you going alone? Because there are generally speaking about three options. Are you going alone? Are you going with a team? Are you going with as an, what's called an embed? And an embed is where you are with uh, a group of armed, you are with an armed group, whether it's a, a rebel group, or whether instead it is some kind of um, it's a it's a professional standing army, and there are there are different ethical concerns about 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 those, but you need to consider very carefully who your teammates are. You want to make sure that they have the proper accreditation. You want, if possible, them to be people that you have used in backgrounds. Now, I want to, for example, in one particular job that I did. I'm again not going to name names here, but I had a driver who had, unbeknownst to me, never had any conflict experience before. And we were driving towards this zone and this driver heard shelling in the distance and he almost freaked out and stopped the car and started to get extremely, extremely upset. He was, you know, saying things like, oh, it's 50-50 our lives. 
50% chance we live, 50% chance we die. Now, I'm a professional at this, and I found myself getting very worked up because I was thinking, well, if the local is saying that our lives are in this much danger, then we must be in this much danger. And when I met other people who had had equivalent drivers who had better experience in this sort of area, they had been much more calm and much more relaxed and much more prepared for what they were facing. Because, you know, if your driver is freaking out or your translator is not well equipped, these can be things that if you're in a foreign conflict zone can be very scary to deal with. It also is important to learn and respect as to as much as possible, find, try and investigate the country in terms of religious and cultural issues. And many of these can provide either, you know, can be either useful or, or not useful. But for instance, very simply, for instance, if you're in a conservative Muslim country, many women will have to wear headscarves. In fact, many female foreign correspondents find that these can be in places like Afghanistan or in Yemen, that these can be quite useful because they can disguise themselves much easier than men could and that they can come across as much less threatening than men can. But there are, you must, you want to as much as humanly possible, ensure that you don't give in a, inadvertent cultural offense. Now, this is usually something that a driver or a translator or anyone in that kind of area can, assist you with and help you out in and leave any perceptions of cultural superiority or even your own be religious beliefs and practices behind with you because they are not going often not going to help you if you are in a foreign cultural environment do as much as you can to now don't go to to extremes with this for instance if you're a conservative muslim country don't usually you don't want to pretend you're a muslim because that can be something that people can take a serious offense at if they find out that you're not and finally, when you are there, before you are going in, you just want to learn to trust your instincts and trust your beliefs and trust your previous experiences as those, uh, as well as those of your particular colleagues. So be aware of your warning signs. As I said, make sure you're in good physical health and that you're able to notice and, and trust your gut about what you are seeing around you. And don't think that a story or the drive for some sort of recognition or glory, don't let it carry you away and don't let it seem as if, you know, it's worth getting because it almost certainly is not. Because if something happens to you, not only are you in danger, but you're putting a huge amount of people who care about you in danger as well. A story or a photo is never worth your life and your um physical or mental well-being. Now, I would like to pause here before I move on to things to do in country and take a few just questions or general concerns or comments, or if anyone has any particular scenarios that they would like to share or has any any general questions or comments that I can respond to. Yeah, that's nice of you, Tom. Thanks uh, for having this uh, small food stop stop here. So, uh, the students, uh, I would like to give the floor to you. So if you have questions, as I wrote in a chat, just uh, use the raise hand button, okay? Dear students, if you have questions uh, for Tom, please... Raise hand, press raise hand. And after that, I will give you... On the chat, them, Kerchentrem, Anjad, the each microphone mute Vijaka, yet for I will ask you to unmute your microphone. Anna Heat, uh, Amir Hanya. Hello, you said that you were both in Armenia and, and in Azerbaijan, but I would like to know whether no, you had a pro. Okay, so she misunderstood it. Apologies. 
Oh, uh, please do do continue with the question. But I, I mean, I use wanted to use that as a hypothetical example of where I was asked to go to Azerbaijan, but I declined that particular request because I thought that the risks outweighed the potential rewards. But do continue with the question because I do know people who have been to both sides and uh, I can give you some sort of feedback on that. Yes, I'm wondering whether there was certain pressure on the people who were in the conflict zone in both countries. Uh, what sort of, do you mean pressures from the government or pressures from people to report in certain ways? No, by the authorities, by the government, not the population. Okay, no problem. I can speak to that easily enough. So in Armenia, that was very, very, at least for us, I don't want to speak to, for any local media, but for us as foreign correspondents, the restrictions were rather low. We had restrictions on visits to particular parts of conflict that they thought were too dangerous for us to visit. Um, and where there were other restrictions, for instance, our photos and our video was usually checked by security officers for to make sure we weren't giving away military positions or anything like that but as far as i'm aware other than that not really there was one russian journalist who was denied accreditation under circumstances that i didn't really understand and maybe you could consider that pressure uh, but in general not really i i spoke with representatives in the armenian foreign ministry when i returned from uh, when I returned uh, from Artsakh, and they didn't like, they liked some of the things I'd written. They had disagreements and um, issues with one, with particularly one thing uh, that I wrote, but they never put any pressure on me to change my reporting. They never, they still issued me with renewed press credentials, and no, I never felt in any kind of danger. In Azerbaijan, as I understand, the, there was much more pressure from the authorities about what people could report and what they could not report. Very few journalists were able to enter the active zone of Azerbaijani uh, combat. Uh, I, I think of, off the top of my head, it was between five to ten uh, journalists or outlets, whereas I think there were uh, around 300 or so different journalists who were allowed to report from Artsakh. And those journalists, what I hear is that in Azerbaijan, they were told very, very directly what they could film and what they could not film. Who The people that they interviewed or I hear were usually provided for them by the Azerbaijani authorities. And there were a number of journalists, I believe it was France 24, who decided to leave Azerbaijan because they didn't feel that they could report fairly and impartially from the conflict zone with the limited access they were given. Now, in general, that was not the experience that I or my colleagues found in Artsakh. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for answering this question. I hope that this was a full answer to your question. Shushan Doidoyan has a question. Uh, we would like to add that Nick also provided assistance to our legal team, and he also told us his story and uh, his witness report, his testimony, uh, describing what dangers uh, journalists encountered when they were covering the conflict and we incorporated this testimony in our case that we brought to the European Court of Human Rights and his input was quite valuable. Actually when listening to your story this is quite terrifying and me as a person who has selected this uh, profession and who is really faithful and dedicated to this profession at the same time I come to fully realize 
realize how risky and how hazardous this job is, including uh, that uh, the danger may uh, actually be a threat to your life. And we also have cases when uh, journalists are simply killed when covering a conflict. So in that case, why do you endanger your life? Why have you selected this specific profession? And why are you specifically focusing on covering conflicts? Because in any case, risking your life is a major decision. So why did you make it? Maybe I'll give you might be helpful to back up a little bit and talk about what I was doing before I started this profession. I was actually working in the United Kingdom. I'm originally, well, I'm originally from New Zealand. I have been based in London for probably about 10 years now. I, I went to university there and I worked there afterwards. And I actually got involved with working in Parliament, in the British Parliament, with uh, research about the British Armed Forces and defence and security issues related to various conflicts that the British Army was facing. Now, in many ways, that was an interesting job, but I found myself also reading a lot of dry and dusty reports about various engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan that I was analysing from the perspective of someone who had never been there and who had never seen it for myself. And I didn't like that sort of desk bound work and I thought I could be of more value reporting from the ground and telling people exactly what I was seeing or what was going on. Uh, as for why this, I chose this, I, so in a sense, rather than directly choosing this profession, I sort of sort of fell into it via via that means. It, it's a good question. And it's something that I ask myself uh, every, not every day. So I should make clear, I've done a good amount of reporting on other situations as well. It's just not like I'm someone who spends, you know, 90% of my time in a, in a war zone. In fact, very few journalists these days are actually like that. Usually I'm report. So for instance, my last project has been in Sudan and I've been trying to do reporting on the Tigray conflict, but much of that is based in displaced persons camps. And that is not a hostile environment in the same way that a conflict zone is. Um, there are also, there are, num there are a number of, so I, I, there are always the reasons that sound good on you know, paper and when you're talking about them. And then there are the reasons that are often more personal. And so one, I do think it's a very important profession. There are people that need to do it and need to be able to impartially report from these zones. So not only so that the international community is aware of what is going on, whether that ends up making a difference as it did in, in Yugoslavia or with, where it didn't in the case of Syria. And also I do think it's very important for the historical record that these sort of conflicts are documented in a lot detail. Then there are the other reasons that are obviously, you know, personal to every sort of person who does this. And they involve the fact that I have a fairly high physical risk tolerance for myself and that I find in that I'm not someone who gets easily scared or afraid in these sort of situations. And I know how to keep my mind calm and clear. And also because to be honest, it is a job that genuinely is quite well respected and well liked. It's a job that a lot of people are interested in. And I think it's, it's fair to say, while a lot of journalists don't like to admit it. Most journalists in this line of work also find that kind of work very invigorating and almost exciting. It's almost a bit of a confession to make that because a lot of conflict journalists don't like saying it publicly, but it is very true. Thank you, Tom. I see that Mariam Ghazarian has a question. Harutun, I raised my hand a few times and you did not react. Why can you give me the floor? I apologize, Mr. Martirosian, and you will follow, Mariam. If there is someone from among the students, let them ask the question and then I will 
try and ask a question. No problem. So in that case, Mariam, the floor is yours. Please ask your question. Good evening. Thank you very much. I have a question for Nick. So you said that your material once failed because your driver panicked. Okay, are there any psychological means which will help us to understand whether we or our teammate would panic so that we before we go to the ground so that we don't fail once on the field hello do i have the floor again yes the floor is yours that's an interesting and a very actually important and valuable question so thank you for that I would say that what you should do is, okay, I'll give you one example, for instance, of a colleague of that I, as I said, I've just come from Sudan. And there was a, as if anyone knows the situation in Sudan, Sudan has had a large number of armed rebellions by rebel groups in the West, in the Darfur regions of Sudan. And they are rebels who can be very unpredictable and very dangerous. And I had a colleague there who was going to, no, sorry, not a colleague of mine. They actually represented a particular European institution and they were going there and to meet with one of the rebel groups on one of their first assignments. And they actually <coughs> said to the rebel group, by the way, uh, I really want to respect, hope that you are respecting social distancing requirements and that you will all be bringing and wearing masks to protect me from the risk if case any of you have COVID-19. And I felt to myself, look, if that's an exam, if you're genuinely scared of getting COVID-19 or of getting some sort of illness or, you know, I'm not talking about something that could potentially, you know, be, be very fatal for you, but something as a young person that's very much unlikely to cause you any problems, this probably isn't the profession that you should be in. And I thought it was a very strange question to ask them. I would say the only way to do it to really know is to don't try and dump, jump yourself in the deep end and don't go as some journalists who are young and fairly naive do to a very dangerously active conflict zone right away don't try and go straight into idlib in syria or helmand in afghanistan or i would say and i know it was probably unavoidable for many of you that karabakh was a particularly uh, dangerous and dicey combat zone rather i would say start with situations that are tense but where there is less active conflict going on and actually to be honest Karabakh right now where there is not a lot of active conflict but there is a lot of political tension and a lot of armed soldiers is a good probably a good place to start for many people other examples might be in the occupied Palestinian territories where there is often a risk of uh, but not the same kind of risks that there are in a very very active war other ones could include rare, because not only that the other problems that you can face is not just your own personal safety but you could not find yourself finding it difficult to deal with the suffering of people that you encounter so maybe working in refugee camps for instance in lebanon refugees from the syrian war that is something so start with situations and conflicts and crises that are a little bit less intense than full-on war zones i my first conflict experience was a was a a trip to the front lines of the ukrainian war where it was actually part of a parliamentary delegation well i, I was to, accompanying a member of, of the british house of lords who wanted to, who had a particular interest in the conflict. And that was a conflict zone that while there was still active fighting and shooting, we actually ended up being shot at at one point. It was a conflict that where there were set front lines, there were very set zones that were not dangerous. We were accompanied by a team of Ukrainian special forces as an escort the whole time. And when I found that I was perfectly able to deal with that, I started going into more into more dangerous places. So build yourself up to it. Don't jump in straight away, is what I would say. Mm 
Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom, for your answer. Mr. Martirosian, now I would ask you to ask your question. Thank you very much for giving me the floor and for this opportunity to ask a question. I have two questions, if our moderator allows us to ask both. But if oh, not... Go for it. Ask both. Thank you very much. I will ask both then, with your permission. So question number one for you. Before going to any conflict zone, is there no necessity for the reporter to study the background and the prehistory of this conflict before they end up in the active conflict zone for them to understand what's going on? And when studying it, uh, which sources or the sources of which side would be more trustworthy? For example, if you come to the Artsakh conflict zone, uh, you know, the reporter studies Armenian sources and they convey completely, completely different information from the sources of the Azerbaijani side. And where does the truth lie where, before you arrive at the conflict zone? And this is the first question. I will ask the second question after your response. I mean, that's that's a that's a question with a lot of very sort of deep philosophical implications that I can't go into all of them, and there this is a, a question where it's it's difficult to get a sort of a right or wrong answer to. Well, here is the thing: is that if you so, I will talk about my own experience with Nagorno Karabakh. So I have a close friend who is a security guide and a fixer, and he specializes in post-Soviet conflict zones. Now, this involves, there are, there are five major post-Soviet conflict zones. There's Transnistria between Romania and Moldova. Well, no, pardon me, between Moldova and Ukraine. There is Donetsk and Luhansk, the uh, territories uh, between co contested between Russia and Ukraine. There are, is the Georgian territories of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And then there is Nagorno-Karabakh itself. So I had, I was helping him prepare a book about these various conflict zones. So I had a, done a little bit of research and a little bit of background studies into these conflicts myself. However, because many of these wars will start very unexpectedly and very, and they will be completely unannounced and you won't and in often, in order to get the best information, you have to be there as quickly as possible. And you don't have time to do in-depth information and research into these kind of conflicts before you get there. So, uh, for instance, there are a number of there are probably people that your uh, um, people may have be aware of or have read, like Thomas De Wall or Lawrence Brewers who were experts, academic experts on the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, but who for various reasons were unable to actually get there. So while it is important to educate yourself as much as possible, sometimes it is not, you, you can't expect it to be an expert on every area that you are involved with, which is why, as I said, probably the best answer is to talk to people from both sides, if you can, of the conflict zone, as reliable as you can, speak to academic experts in the field, and it's also why I like to speak to a journalist who has reported from this area of the world. One other preparation, one other item of preparation you should take is you should also familiarize yourself with at least the basics of a foreign language which can be useful out there. Most reporters spoke, uh, who went to Artsakh spoke at least rudimentary Russian, if not Armenian, because uh, uh, Russian is obviously very useful in Artsakh. 
in terms of trusting sources, I, it's just this, it's just good to be educated in how people respond and how people behave under various forms of stress or various conflict zones, but there is no way to really get to the truth of a matter unless you have spent a long time there and spoken to enough people who've been involved in the whole of the conflict. It's difficult to get to, to answer that question also without knowing specifically where you are or what sources you will have access to. Because obviously, one of the problems we had with the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict is that Azerbaijani sources are much more reticent about talking about it because, for instance, Azerbaijani civil society activists were sometimes arrested if they opposed uh, war or opposed something like that most of the people you could speak you know there are a few reliable people who while they come from the <coughs> Azerbaijani perspective have uh, some have you know important information to share with you I know I can't give a direct and specific answer to your question but I hope that that sorts a little bit out at least to your second question thank you very much thank you very much and very Concisely, the second question. It is well known that reporters are often targeted in conflict zones. Should the uniform wear it with the label press and the whole protective gear that they should have, is this necessary? or the reporter can wear whatever military uniform or civilian outfit and they're still enjoying some uh, benefits and they should not be targeted or should the reporter go there just as they feel or is there a specific outfit they should wear good question uh, I'll go through those one by one and I'll start from what you should not do. You should never under any circumstances wear a military uniform. And this is a very, very silly decision. Uh, another thing you should never ever do is even pick up or hold a firearm uh, or a gun or any kind of piece of military equipment. And that is because if you are in a conflict zone and you pick up a gun, any you can be shot at and they can say that they reasonably thought that you were a combatant and that you and that you posed a threat to them and you do not therefore have the protections that you do of a journalist under the Geneva Convention because say if I had if I had been on a just a, a, a an example if I had been on the Artsakh or a Ukrainian front line and someone had given me a gun and I'd held it and I posed with it and I had been shot the oppose it whoever had shot me even if i was a journalist could reasonably claim and they would be correct this person i thought posed a threat because they were holding a weapon never ever do that i know it looks cool to have weapon to, to post photos on facebook or whatever holding guns but while it makes you look tough it's a silly silly thing to do it's a problem I think more men have trouble with trying to look macho and impressive, but basically don't do it. Same with the military uniform. You could be mistaken for a soldier and you could be and you could be killed. So I would always try and encourage journalists to go into conflict zones with as much protective equipment as they possibly can, sometimes without overdoing it. Uh, you know, flak jackets, helmets, there were, you know, a number of organizations very kindly were providing those for journalists in Artsakh, and you should be labeled as, and you should have notifications that you are labeled as press that are as visible as humanly possible, to be honest, because basically anything that identifies you as a journalist means you are less likely to be targeted. It's not a cure all, it doesn't stop everything, but it is as good as you can get. And the main reason that someone might not want to target you because you're a journalist, they won't be believers in free expression, but for them, it can make their lives very difficult. And you know, if you're a journalist kidnapped in a foreign country, and you're clearly identified as a journalist, it I mean there could be international pressure for your release, a country doesn't want to risk a bad human rights record, maybe, or things like that. 
There are places where it's unavoidable, where you have to go into a country as a tourist uh, or hide the fact that you're a journalist. Unfortunately, Venezuela was one of those places. I, I didn't wear personal protective equipment there because that would have gotten me in trouble with the authorities who could have thought I'm some kind of armed rebel or a saboteur or and they don't particularly care about press freedom there but in general where possible avoid any kind of military outfit <clears throat> and try and carry as much press identification and personal protective equipment as possible <laughs> Thank you, Tom, for answering your questions. Ophelia, I Thank you. Just said that as a reporter, you participated in the second Kartak war and you were in the conflict zone. Can you please describe the psychological state of the soldiers during the war and how did it impact on your own psychological state? Thank you. It's a very interesting question and it goes, it was a very interesting experience with uh, being in Armenia, not just with the soldiers, but with the entire community. It was a, it was a difficult experience because the war was so bloody and brutal and because I was there mo during most of the second half of, of the war. And one of the difficult things to, to sort of say, and if any of our problems with the Armenian authorities ever happened, they happened here, is that by the end of October, most people in the military who we were speaking with and fighting with knew that it was probable that Armenia would lose the war. Most soldiers we spoke to were, were very worried for their, for their friends and for their family and for their own personal situation and for their own safety. I have a, I am due to publish for the six month anniversary, a collection of the, uh, of the photographs that me and some other journalists took of these soldiers that we met. And in almost all of them, you can see you know, the examples where they look quite, their faces are quite white. They look like they've not been very well, they haven't slept very well. They look, I don't want to say scared, but they look nervous and because they knew that there was a good chance that they could be killed. This can contrast quite differently with soldiers that you will meet where the conflict isn't as intense, where those soldiers look bored. And yes, I'll be honest, it did have a bit of a psychological impact on us. In the bunkers afterwards, many journalists there that I saw were just breaking down and they were just crying because whether they had been had a near miss or they knew someone who was on the front lines and, and was in danger, uh, I think I cried a bit myself when I came back just after sort of reflecting on what we had seen and what we had been through. And yes, it was it was quite psychologically tough for everyone involved. Um, in terms of ways to avoid this, honestly, it's pretty difficult to it's pretty difficult to do. And you just really need to be aware of your own psychological limits and not be afraid to leave if you feel that you are in some sort of, of, of danger and in some sort of trouble. So I hope that answers your question, but feel free to ask further if you want any more specifics. Thank you. If Ophelia has an additional question, 
Hello. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to ask a question. Dear Nick, you said that they cannot make you get scared very easily. And I would ask you to tell us about the most scary incident that happened to you when you were acting as a journalist. <laughs> as if there okay. were very few scary incidents. No, 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 the most terrifying one. Okay, the most terrifying. Um, to be honest, they were probably, okay, I, want, I, I do want to, to make clear on one thing, is that I am not someone who is like, when I say, said I don't get scared easily, I do still get scared. And that I, I often wonder, actually, if someone doesn't get scared at all, they may have some kind of psychological health problem, and they probably shouldn't be doing this job either, because they won't be able to realise the risks of, of what is happening in their job. So fear is an important response to knowing when you're in a scary situation. Um, I, so there was obviously the incident that I spoke about, about the drone strikes in Karabakh but in some ways that was less scary than than other incidents simply because it was over very quickly and we were out of the zone very quickly and it was more an adrenaline rush. Uh, two experiences that I can think of one was the one I already described in Venezuela because this was you know once you're back in Stepanakert when you were covering the war you could get, be in a shelter very easily you were around a lot of colleagues and friends and family oh, sorry not family you're or maybe maybe in some cases you were if you were Armenian and you could sort of relax and reminisce and you could be somewhere safe I would say the experience one of them was the experience I had in Venezuela uh, where I because as soon as I was alone I didn't know the situation as well as I do when I go to conflict zones now. And so I didn't know what sort of danger I was in. I didn't know if someone could have been following me or could have extorted me. Uh, I didn't I didn't have an easy escape route in the same way that I could by getting out of Martini. Another one happened when I was doing a job in Pakistan, had absolutely nothing to do with the conflict I was reporting on. I was stuck in an avalanche between two places I was reporting from. Uh, there, while there are conflicts in Pakistan, I was covering some of the less dangerous areas, but we were on a very precarious mountain pass and we got stuck in an avalanche and there were rocks falling all around us. And for the locals, this was a common experience. And so they got out and tried to clear the road of avalanches, which if you know anything about this is something you should never do. And you know, we didn't want to look like we were the scared foreigners. So me and my, my colleagues, we got out and they we went to clear the rocks in the road and some rocks nearly fell on us and we had to run for it and we were stuck in that situation for about nine hours where we had no idea whether we could could get out or anything like that uh, those are the most scary experiences I think I've had again there is no shame in being somewhat afraid my you know my risk tolerance is higher than most people but there are some times where I think fear is there to tell you about the risks that you shouldn't take. Okay. Thank you very much for this answer. Please add it to the Raiser line for quite a long time, and then I will ask Lucia. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm wondering when and where did you first hear about Armenia and Armenians, and why did you choose to cover the situation in Armenia? Most the second art war specifically realizing that this could for example uh, bring an end to your life and put an end to your career because your life was threatened okay 
As I mentioned a bit earlier, I have a colleague who is very well, um, it's, it started when I was doing research uh, in Parliament, I was doing research on the conflict in Ukraine. Then I met a, a colleague whose work, whose work is about all post-Soviet conflict zones, so that included Nagorno-Karabakh, and he told me about the situation when he was there close to the war in to, or the short conflict in 2016, the four day war. And I became interested in researching and learning about the various sides of the conflict and the, the various ways in which it was being reported and the ways it was affecting the society. So it was it was through my parliamentary research and then from uh, my friend who is a, a fixer there and after I had been doing that as soon as the conflict broke out I thought look this is an important opportunity to actually see what is going on for myself and to be able to report and research and write about these particular conflict zones with more authority and experience and it was also because quite frankly uh, a lot of journalists were stuck because of reporting restrictions so many of the experts as i said were not able to travel to armenia and report on, on the conflict because of restrictions to travel surrounding covid19 look part of it is to be quite honest is that many met with many journalists is that they wanted to get back into the field after having been stuck you know, without being able to travel or work or do what they do for a long time. So a variety of reasons, really. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Thank you for answering this question for being willing and ready to take all the questions. And Lucine, the last question. I have two questions with your permission. First of all, Jake, according, pardon me? I just said yes, your permission granted, go ahead. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the most important feature or what are the most important features of a reporter that they should never uh, fail to comply with? If this makes any sense. Okay, um, all right. There are, look, reporters of, uh, come in all varieties with all varieties of jobs and a lot of reporters cut corners ethically and some reporters exaggerate situations and there are all sorts of things that reporters do from time to time that honestly they get away with. There is one and it's really only one golden rule that reporters have, and that is to never compromise confidential sources. Never under any circumstance report the identity of a, of a person who has made clear that they do not wish to be identified. Um, do not, you know, make sure that you take all reasonable steps to protect the identity of confidential sources. This is extremely important in conflict zones. For instance, you know, I had to pit talk to people in, in Azerbaijan who I could never reveal the identity of because they could be targeted you know, under certain conditions by, by the government's regime in, in Azerbaijan. This is, this is something that reporters take extremely seriously. And one of the sort of ethical kind of commandments that you have is that if necessary, you should be willing to go to jail uh, if a court orders you to prov provide the identity or your witness statements of to find out who your confidential source is, you should be willing to go to jail before you give up the identity of that source. You can get away with a lot in journalism, but that is one thing that you cannot get away with is betraying your sources or betraying the privacy and confidentiality of people who shared information with you. Uh, there are there are other, of course, guidelines, but that is, in my opinion, probably the most crucial one, because if a journalist breaks this, 
then you don't just jeopardize your own relationship with your personal sources. You make it much, much harder for other journalists to get information from confidential sources because they think because you tar the profession with a bad name. So yeah, if there's only one May, and probably a secondary rule I would say to remember that's more applicable to conflict zones is the idea that your life is never worth a, a story or a photo or anything like that. You know, you will have other opportunities to report on these kind of events and you will never get the chance to tell these stories if you end up not just killed but disabled or psychologically wounded. So they're, they're, those would I say would be the two rules to remember. That are, that are the most crucial. Yeah, thank you. Lee. So you said you had a second oh, question. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. And have you ever thought about abandoning this profession for any reason? For example, that you have got tired or that you are disappointed and you would select a different profession? Um, yeah, uh, um, yeah, yes and no, to be honest, I think so journalism is a profession that is different from many others in that there are a few in that, you know, most professions, uh, maybe it's changing a little bit with 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 COVID-19. But most other professions are a lot more stable, you are doing a job that requires you to work certain hours that requires you to be there, you know, in a, whether it's in an office or on Zoom between, you know, nine o'clock to seven o'clock during the day. And you're doing more or less the same things day in and day out. And you have a reason and you have a regular stream of income and you have regular, uh, regular pay, you know, regular pay and you have regular amounts of work that you have to do in time that you can take off and time that you have to yourself. Journalism, especially when you work, um, the majority of my work is freelance, especially when you work freelance can be stressful for a number of reasons, but it can also be extremely rewarding in another number of other reasons. So I would say that the best parts of journal of, of this lifestyle are the are some of the most interesting experiences that anyone can have working any job and the number of negative aspects to it is very very high as well it's a job with a what we say is a lot of the high very high highs and very low lows so yes as i said um i've had you know i've i've come to times where for instance i've had a contract that's fallen through and that i've you know i in journalism for instance you will have cases where you know people you'll, will ask you to do work and then you'll do the work and they'll find an excuse just not to pay you for whatever reason that will make you want to quit a profession if you have a if you have a, a your rent due or something like that you'll have times when you're in conflict zones or whatever as i said i mentioned earlier the example of the of the editor who wanted to be who said oh i actually don't want your work from nagorno karabakh i want you to go to azerbaijan instead when i had spent a long time preparing this work and then just didn't want me to pay me for the work i'd done afterwards that wouldn't happen in the vast majority of other professions but in journalism that can be a thing that does happen ah yeah i will after that i was like screw this do i really really want to work in this profession so you know while 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 it's not something I want to leave at the moment, there are definitely a lot, a lot of negative elements that you need to consider if you want to, if you want to do this profession. Yeah. Thank you, Nick, for answering to the questions. Now, if possible, let's use this uh, 15, 20 minutes to go through your presentation because there was a stop. So yeah, yeah. take the floor. Okay, so I should just say, yeah, the stop just went on for a little bit longer than, than I expected, so I'm probably not going to get to finish all of my presentation. And so I will go, so I will go through as quickly as I can the main points. And some of the points that I was actually going to raise have been covered in in the uh, in what we were talking about. So for instance, my next point was going to be about personal protective equipment, uh, which I answered in a previous question and that you should all do. Then there are other, other things as well involving. So instead of talking about personal protective equipment, I'll talk about something else. And that is security and hostile environment training. 
this can be rather and insurance as well these can be rather controversial among journalists as to whether you should take them or not however a lot of very of, of reputable private firms provide hostile environment training which is where you effectively go in often usually with former soldiers who will do things like they will do a mock you know they'll do things like they'll pretend to kidnap you or interrogate you and ask you the questions uh, that you would experience if you were in that kind of environment. They will also have things where they will test your ability to react to different situations. Now, the ish downside with these courses is that they can be rather expensive and for a profession that is not always very well paid, you have to consider whether you can afford to do them. And you will often need to do them because employers will, will require you to have them. I would say I would very much advise you to do hostile environment training, though, though I will be perfectly honest in my case, I went to conflict zones before I had done the, the training. Uh, but at the very least, at the very, very, very bare minimum, you should take a course in emergency first aid now there's actually a foundation called risk r-i-r-i-s-c which was set up to provide i don't know again i can't speak to the armenian uh, landscape in terms of funding and training for these opportunities but you should investigate them if you can and this organization was set up after a quite well-known conflict journalist called tim hetherington was killed in libya through a wound that didn't need to be fatal and so his colleagues then set up a course to for free teach emer journalists emergency first aid training because if there is ever going to be something that could save your or someone else's life it's knowing those sort of things like how to wrap a wound in a tourniquet or even you know even things like you know how to inject someone who is having an allergic reaction or anaphylactic shock or something that can or uh, emergency dental care if someone has some sort of pro problem there or emergency, are there also emergency psychological first aid for learning how to deal with someone who has been in the situation of, uh, you know, who has an episode like, or has something worse than my driver and, and breaks down psychologically, uh, being able to get to, to sort of do impromptu counseling sessions to make sure those people can get back on their feet. So that is one very, very important aspect of uh, that you should consider if you're going into this line of work. There, there was a, one more. There's another thing that I was going to talk about, which I've touched on a little bit, but I wanted to talk about the difference between going there alone and going there with what's called an embed. Now, these became popular in really in the 1990s they were between um american forces and american journalists covering iraq and afghanistan what these uh journalists would do would go along and go around with an embedded military organization they would often go into battle with them and there are some really good advantages of these i did this in ukraine is that you get to go around effectively with soldiers who know the front line, who know where they are and know, you know, the situation. And if you get caught in some kind of firefight, you have people that are there to protect you and you can go to the more dangerous areas. But that also has some advantages and it has some disadvantages and some people prefer to go solo or if not solo then with a team or at the very least locals the disadvantages of this is that a military unit is probably going to at some point be shot at come under fire whether it's from artillery or or an enemy force and even if they are not targeting directly they can still they can still still um you know you can get caught in the crossfire there was a sad case in i think it was about 2016 where a young freelancer had embedded with rebel forces in the south of sudan in south sudan 
when that country was experiencing a civil war. He was, he was, you know, younger than me, younger than most of the students. I think he was 25 or 26, and he ended up being killed because that he was, um, you know, the the South Sudanese uh, government. Uh, forces thought he was uh, a, a combatant and they just shot him. So, you know, you have to be aware of, of these risks. And the other disadvantage to embedding is that a little, not to the same extent, but a little bit like what I said with Azerbaijan, with people who tried to report in Azerbaijan, is that you are more likely to get a biased and unobjective view of the conflict zone. It was interesting is that one of the reasons that the American forces were happy to have journalists embedded with their military is because often those journalists would become very sympathetic and they would actually form a bond with the soldiers they had been with and they were covering. And this would mean they were much less likely to give, to give away, um, they would be much less likely to uh, say things that these soldiers who had become their friends wouldn't like or would put in uncomfortable positions. So, and it also is the fact that, you know, journalists, as I said before, were, were often able to cover conflicts from both sides. There were cases where journalists could literally cross, go to one, one side, cross to the other side, and interview the heads of two armies that were fighting each other both in the same day. Now journalists who are suspected of having, you know, being in relationships with their enemy side are treated with much more suspicion. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm just kind of going through my notes a bit here to find bit things that I haven't covered uh, in the questions because I I think I had covered most of them. Okay, one that is important to also keep in mind is the security of your data and the security of your communications when you are abroad in the field. This can mean two different things. This can mean one is do you make, can you make sure that you have a clear cell phone or some kind of other line that will connect you to someone in case you get in trouble? And the second thing you have to know is do you have abilities to protect your data in case your phone or your laptop or any of the electronic devices you are working with you know, so the 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 famous case, the instructive case on this, was the case of a, a journalist. The name may be familiar to many of you. Her name was Marie Colvin, and in two thousand and twelve, she was reporting from. I think actually I'll tell I'll tell the story in a little bit more detail because it's a story that I think actually shows quite well a number of the elements that I was talking about all through my lecture. She was a very, very famous British journalist. Um, she had covered wars almost everywhere in the world. Uh, there's a, there was a quite a there was a actually a Hollywood film made about her name. She was famous because she had had an eye. Um, blow, you know, damaged. And when she was in Sri Lanka, she wore an eye patch. And she was also famous in both a good and a bad way for taking more risks than almost any other jerk. She, as I said, you, you ask about fear, she literally had zero fear at all. And that was wonderful uh, for getting stories, but it will, as you're about to hear, have quite a sad end. She went into Syria in 2012 at the very, very start of the war. And what happened to her was she went in, was smuggled into the city of Homs, which was where the re regime was bombarding very, very closely with artillery. And there's actually an, an, a fantastic documentary called Under the Wire that I would recommend you all watch if you want to really know a lot about what conflict journalism is like. It's it's the most it's the most extreme of conflict journalism. So if you watch that film, don't be terrified and think, oh, all reports like this is like that because it's not but what happened is she was smuggled through a an abandoned pipeline like i think it might have been a gas pipeline into the city where she was shelled and she used her satellite cell phone in order to write a story about the syrian regime they then left 
uh, that place and went to a slightly more secure location in Syria. And they then went back in to do a second report. Now, her cameraman who was with her said that he had said before going in that he had been not been heard and been strongly advised, and he had a very strong feeling not to go back in, but they decided to go back in anyway. And the regime had have been had been able to keep her, to have tracked her with a satellite cell phone when she had filed her last story they found her and they bombarded the place that her and the other journalists were staying with artillery and tragically she was killed and another photojournalist who was there at the same time with her was killed so there is a very very basic thing of now this is the kind of thing that you need that often you can find professional track because this is all digit this is about digital security and digital communications you can often find a variety of lectures and seminars that will be for free online that you can take uh, to avoid you know digital risks it's learning about basic rules of encryptions and how to keep your communications and mobile devices safe i unfortunately i don't have enough time to go into them in in detail now but i would highly recommend that anyone takes those courses they can be genuine legitimate lifesavers but as i said uh, but by my reckoning we've only got about five minutes left so i thought that this was a good uh place to sort of end on because it gives because that story also illustrates one of the crucial factors that i talked about when i uh, began this lecture which is about how no story is ever worth the life of the person who is reporting it and she had taken risks but and everyone who was there says that despite how brave she was she went in for a second time when the situation had gotten more dangerous where she really didn't have to and where people around her were saying that it was a bad idea to go in and that is an example of where i would say you should have realized that you know your life is more valuable than the story and always you don't have to err on the side of caution all the time because there are some cases where taking physical risk is genuinely worth the story but always remember that your personal well-being and the well-being of those around you comes first now i wonder if the organizers have any final questions or uh, or comments or want me to, to to say anything to conclude yeah thank you uh tom for our presentation and these final words actually I would say that at this moment, if there are like urgent questions from the students, let's take those questions, give them opportunity. And at the end, we will have like final closing speech from Shushan and also the Dean. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Are there questions? Dear students, do we have any questions? If yes, please raise your hand. And I will give you an opportunity to pose the question. It seems that we do not have any question. In that case, I would ask you, Shushan, to give us your concluding remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick for this very interesting, for this very important and real experience-based uh, knowledge sharing session. Thank you very much for sharing uh, some skills or some hints with our students. And I enjoyed your lecture today. And there are two very important points that I would like to highlight further that Nick addressed. That is to say, the first one is your life is of the highest value ever. And the most important value that one has or the valuable thing one has is his or her life. And truly, no story or no report uh, is worth your life or risking your life. And the second one, that important thing that Nick just said is that in no circumstance should you break uh, 
uh, the promise that you have given to your confidential uh, sources of information. And if you have promised that you would keep them anonymous and confidential, you should live up to it. And even if they, you are threatened by imprisonment or other kinds of sanctions, still you should keep it confidential. And this is one of the foundations of uh, freedom of press. And once you breach this, then you lose your, uh, your trustworthiness. And uh, this is what I would like to conclude my uh, final remarks with. Thank you, Ned, for your time, for your efforts, and for this uh, conversation. And I would like to thank our students once again for their very interesting questions, for their dedicated and engaged participation. And I am hopeful that this knowledge is going to be useful to you in your professional activity. Thanks to you, Harutun, of course. And of course, thanks to our interpreter who has been uh, ensuring the translation at a very high professional level. Thank you, Christine, for providing high quality interpretation. And thanks Mr. to you, Mr. Martirosian, for uh, leading this whole effort and for coordinating it and for your personal dedication. Thank you, Ms. Doidoyan. I'm convinced that we all are saying goodbye to Nick with loads of positive impressions. And uh, we are still convinced that we will have an opportunity to listen more of him uh, already offline. And I'm not only impressed, but also I was thinking as the Dean of the journalism department that if Nick decides to come and reside in Yerevan, we will be happy to invite him to come and teach at the journalism department at Yerevan State University. And and he will be an excellent teacher of covering conflicts for our students. And I'm convinced that our students have acquired very serious knowledge and Nick provided very important keys to, keys to our students, which they can use to open up more doors and to find new knowledge. And I'm convinced that this series of lectures is really and has been useful. And I would like to extend my special gratitude to Freedom of Information Center of Armenia and personally to Ms. Doidoyan, thanks to Harutun Zatarian, thanks to our dear students who were so willing to listen and to internalize new knowledge and new information. And once again, Nick, thanks a lot for this very interesting and this exclusively informative and educational lecture. I would like to wish you all a peaceful evening and may the light be peaceful unto us. Not thank a good you, time. thanks to all. Uh, thank you very much. Have a good yeah, day. Thank you much. Uh, all Thank the participants attending. Dear uh, participants, thank you very much. Let's name Bolora in Usano Ashkatov Nerin. Of Kate, uh, Naev Leragrutam's Bahuman, Neran Samar Vare, Jame Yotin, Yevas Hetak Kitan Dipumes Pasum, I'd Handi Pumakalini, Usano Neri Homer Nahates, but Arachin, Handi Pan Huri, uh, Tommy, Inchpes Nev, Dikin Doidani, Michev Knark Manzeva Chapo, Nank of Kate, Ashatumen, Ashatov Leragdor Neri, I just never call in Mianal Vare. Yerekoyan <gülüyor> 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 <gülüyor>